Well, we continue our series through 1 Thessalonians uh, today, and uh, I don't know if you like to watch the news. I sometimes like to watch the news, but I grew up in a house where the news was always on. Now, growing up on the farm in rural Idaho, we had two channels. Two channels, that was it, until much later when we purchased this ginormous satellite dish. Remember those? Uh, I think we still have it in somewhere on the farm. Uh, and then we got this endless amount of channels. And we would flip through and flip through and flip through and think, there's nothing on. <laughs> still do that, don't we? But we have endless numbers of voices that we hear each day. From major news networks to local newspaper to news channels to YouTube to social media, and we could go on and on and on, couldn't we? We could follow the latest fads and trends and economic projections. We could go on about all the options we have. Our whole day, our entire day could be spent just watching the news, and keeping up with what's going on in the world. Our options are endless. But like I said, I grew up with two TV stations, and the one person that I trusted the most was Dan Rather. Remember Dan? He was the one I trusted to bring me the truth every night. I thought, as a young boy, that whatever he said carried the most authority as a news anchor. He was the guy that was going to tell me and my family the truth. Now we know that every news channel, every YouTube channel, every social media post has a slant, has a way to go about how they present the news. So the question is, who and why do we give the most clout to, the most authority to when we watch the news, whether we, or we listen to something on a podcast, how do we know that they're giving us accurate information? Which side do we find ourselves on on any given topic when there are multiple angles and multiple views? And every day we decide which voice we give the most authority to, don't we? And also, as followers of Jesus, we call ourselves people, people of the book. Now, my iPad just died. Hopefully, I just hit a button. There we go. Whew. We call ourselves people of the book, meaning that the Bible is the foundation for our faith and our source of guidance for our lives. We do this not to just glorify an ancient book. But we look beyond the Bible to the way the Spirit of God addresses us through the pages of Scripture. We put Scripture at the top of our list of authority. Because Scripture is a vehicle through which the Spirit of God has chosen to speak. We believe that the Bible is inspired by the Holy Spirit which led to writings and compiling and canonizing of the book that we have today. Now, inspiration has to do with the work of the Holy Spirit, influencing authors and compilers of Scripture to produce writings that are adequately reflecting what God desires to communicate to us. The more difficult part of describing how is how inspiration took place to get to the Bible that we have today, but... That's a sermon for another day. Today, I want to think about not just the authority of Scripture and what, it has, what impact it has on our life, but how does the Holy Spirit work in our lives as we read, we learn, and we practice living out what it means to be a believer today. We have more access to the Bible than any other generation in history. We can read it from our phones, multiple translations at our fingertips, just about any language imaginable. 
We have resources and videos and theological insight everywhere we turn. Every day, you can get an email from N.T. Wright inviting you to participate in a study with him. And you can sit and you can listen to him. You can listen to lectures and sermons of past preachers throughout the generations. We have so many resources. But nothing compares to having Scripture come alive to us as the Spirit of God works in our life. Sometimes in very small and gentle movements and other times in grand occasions. When we give the Spirit, Scripture and the Spirit, authority to work, the Spirit of God goes to work. I don't know if you'll remember this. In February 2023, earlier this year, there was a regular scheduled chapel service. A small number of students stayed and prayed together after. It's what it's been called the Asbury Revival. A few students gathered after a chapel service and prayed together and confessed their sin together and allowed the Spirit of God to move in their life. What took place earlier this year on that campus was remarkable, and students' lives were changed in the hundreds of thousands of people as they heard about it, as they responded to it, as people from other campuses went and experienced revival. Maybe you've been to camp or a conference or a chapel service where God's Spirit was especially present. Maybe you have felt God's Spirit in a particular song that we've sung or a particular service that you've been a part of. The inspiring work of God is hard to pin down. It's hard to define, impossible to produce on our own. Often described in the Bible, the Holy Spirit's described as wind and fire. The Spirit of God is alive and active, moving among us and in us. But we can't make the Spirit of God move or be more present. Our role is to give our lives to the practice of coming together before God. Paul reminds us that where two or three are gathered, the Spirit of God is active and is present there. Today is the National Day of Prayer for the Persecuted Church. The video highlights a couple places where persecution is most active in our world. And we stand with those people that face persecution and hatred. And we don't experience that a, a lot here in Canada. We're not threatened by coming together to worship God. But Paul was. In 1 Thessalonians, as we stick around, we stick with this theme uh, of persecution, Paul was persecuted. The early church suffered because of what they believed. Some in, Thessalonian, in Thessalonica believed that Paul was a charlatan and a money-hungry leech, only interested in his own outcome and his own well-being. Accusations rose among the early church and those that were in the city about Paul's behavior. And Paul, in chapter 2, quickly reminds them how gentle and loving he was, how sincere he was, that he worked night and day. He worked honestly and hard to make sure that he represented Jesus well. And we stick with that theme this morning as we read 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 2, 9 to 13. Let me read that this morning. Surely you remember, brothers and sisters, our toil and hardship. We work night and day in order to be a burden, to not be a burden to anyone while we preach the gospel of God to you. You are witnesses, and so is God, of how holy, righteous, and blameless we were among you who believed. For you knew, for you know that we dealt with each other 
as a father deals with his own children, encouraging, comforting, and urging you to live lives worthy of God, who calls you into his kingdom and glory. And we also thank God continually because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it. You, you accepted it not as human word, but as it actually is. The word of God, which is indeed at work in you who believe. Now, according to Open Doors, which is the organization that puts on the National Day of Prayer for the Persecuted Church, there are approximately 69 million Christians living in India, representing 5% of the population. Indian believers have an opportunity to share the gospel in some of the most restricted and unreached regions of our world. But because of the RSS, an Indian right-wing Hindu organization, there are informants in almost every village. Churches have been demolished and burned, worship gatherings disrupted, and Bibles confiscated. In December of 2022, an estimated 200 Christians over from 70 different families were forced out of their homes in their villages. They were told to either give up their faith or to leave their village. We can't imagine that, can we? In Nigeria, Africa's most populous nation, which is sharply divided among religious lines from Muslim-denominated north to a major uh, majority Christian south, due to increased violence, nearly all Christians in the northern region have lost family members because of their faith. Many have been forced to leave their homes, livelihoods, and resulting in mass poverty. It takes great courage and faith to openly worship and serve Christ there. Thousands of Christians remain in camps designated for intentionally displaced people. In Nicaragua, which was part of our video this morning, there's a large Christian influence. Over 90% are Christians, but they are persecuted by the government. This was fueled by an incident in 2018 when the church provided care for people during a widespread protest against the government. And today, in 2023, the government continues to retaliate against them, against believers, not allowing them to meet together, arresting leaders and pastors. It's hard for us to believe, and you don't hear much about that on the nightly news, do you? New believers in Paul's time were persecuted for believing that Jesus was the Messiah. In a world where there were idols worshipped, putting faith in a new king was not acceptable. Caesar was the king. He was the king to be worshipped. He was the one to provide glory and might and to reign on the throne in his kingdom. And Paul's message was, flew in the face of Caesar and his reign. Jesus was in direct opposition to Caesar. He was in direct opposition to worshiping idols, focused mostly on worship more than living lives of, of holy and pure lives. When Gentiles believed in Jesus as the Messiah, they changed their lives drastically. They stopped living one way and started living a totally different way. When that happened, it became a disruption. Living out the fruits of the Spirit in our lives is a disruption to the world around us. Some of us, may suffer persecution because of that. Believing that God was the only God and has ultimate authority in our lives may cause some people, as it did in Paul's day, to be uncomfortable with the way we live our life. 
The Thessalonians believed not just in Paul's message, that it was a good message, but that it was the word of God. It wasn't because Paul was a smooth talker. They believed Paul's message because of what it came from or where it came from, that it was God's word and the spirit of God moved in their lives and changed their life. They allow the spirit of God to change them to become the authority of their life. God, through the work of the Holy Spirit and through the words of Scripture, has the power to change our lives, doesn't it? We believe that. We hold to that, even in the midst of persecution. Why else would 69 million Christians suffer? Because they believe in the power and the authority of God. There is no other answer to that. When we give Scripture authority, when we give the Spirit of God authority, we have the ability to do something beyond ourselves. We have the courage to face persecution, even in the face of death. We know this because we have seen it work, and we have seen God at work in our lives We have seen people surrender to God's authority and allow God to transform their life. I have seen that in friends where they have surrendered their lives to Jesus, walked away from drugs and alcohol to live a new and different life. It's through the power of the Spirit that transforms their life. There is no other answer than that. It's often been said that the Bible is called a manual for life. But if you were to present that manual to somebody else and to say, here, this is the manual for our life, it's complicated, isn't it? It's not organized very well. There's some repeating parts of the Bible, there are some things that are completely left out. There are some things that don't make any sense to us in Scripture. So yes, we can call it a manual, but Jesus is not interested in just making sure that we follow all the rules. He's interested in us us as we come to Scripture and allow the Spirit of God to transform us. And that will look different for each one of us. Some of us might be called to come and preach. Some of us might be called to come and lead. Some of us might be called to cook in the kitchen. Some of us might be called to clean. God's work is not the same For each one of us. He calls us to come and to surrender. To its authority. To the spirit's authority. And allow the words from the page. To change us. And that will look different for each one of us. One one author writes. People who. With, sur- with surrendered wills and baptized imaginations, partner with Jesus in surprised ways to make their corner of the earth look a little bit more like heaven. People are set free by the truth. People are set free by the truth that Scripture provides as the Spirit moves in our life. Reading God's word changes our lives, doesn't it? Allowing the spirit of God to move in our life changes our life. Doesn't mean we'll get it all right away. And it doesn't mean that once we read 1 Thessalonians, we don't ever have to read it ever again. Or James. Do you know how many Bible studies I've been for the book of James? 
I think in, during my time at Briarcrest, every Bible study I was a part of, the first book we started was the book of James. And we started new Bible studies. Hey, let's study the book of James. And every time I learned something new, every time I was challenged by the authority of Scripture and the movement of the Spirit through the book of James. That's how alive and active and moving the Spirit of God is. And God calls us just simply to come and surrender, to take time and to read, to meditate, to ponder, to question, to think about, to read over and over and over again, what does the Spirit of God have for me today as I open his word and give it authority to change my life? How is God asking me to work in our world for change? How am I giving the Spirit of God authority to move and to work?